Class is in session. Hey everybody, welcome to Unlearn 16, class is in session. Today you just get me. Just me, myself, and I. And you know what? Sometimes I sit here and I'm like, as I'm coming up to make a podcast, I think, uh, what am I going to talk about? It's not always top of mind. But I do have something. I think I'm going to go down memory, memory. I think I'm going to try to speak today. I think I'm going to go down memory lane today. And I'm going to do it. And I'm going to talk about my mistakes. I, we spend a lot of time rationalizing our mistakes. We spend a lot of time, you know, saying, but I couldn't have learned what I learned if I didn't. Look, that, that might all be true. But we can still acknowledge the mistake that we made and understand that even if, <laughs> this is going to be a hard one to swallow, even if I learned nothing, I still, the learning process, I still have to go back and I still have to recognize the mistake I made, the error in judgment, the error in character, the error in you know, trusting in somebody else necessarily, you know, and I, I get it. I get it. We're all going to be like, well, but you wouldn't be where you are today. Okay. You're right. I'm not saying regret because regret does denote a different life path, but I am saying mistake. I am saying these are the moments I screwed up and just to see them in and of themselves, I think is important guys. I'm going all the way back to grade three. Grade three, grade two, are you guys ready? That's how far back I'm going. I cheated on my time test. That's right. Now you guys know. I was sitting in that class, maybe grade two, I don't know. Now you're all gonna judge me about when I didn't learn to learn, when I didn't learn how to tell time. And our job was to look at these little clocks, not digital, little clocks with hands. And you're supposed to write down what time it was. And I looked at my neighbor's <laughs> sheet. They were very smart and obviously a lot more competent than I. And I wrote down the answers. And when I got home, I showed my mom the test. She looked at it as I got 100 and said, Joanna, how did you do this? And I said, what do you mean? I just took the test. I was that good. And she goes, she goes, okay. And she wrote down a clock and asked me to tell her I couldn't do it because obviously she's like, no, 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 no. How did you get these right answers? And I said, well, so-and-so sitting next to me wrote them down and I copied them. And my mom looked at me disapprovingly, obviously, and said, Joanna, that's cheating. And I was young enough to know that I didn't want to cheat, but to know that I had. I was young enough. I, I guess I was old enough, rather, to know that I needed to cheat to somehow do well on a test in what? Grade two? And I said, Mom, I, I shared. My neighbor shared with me. Got to like that use of those words, right? Kids are freaking brilliant. I shared. And my mom said that, you know, that's not sharing. That's cheating. And I look at that moment as innocuous as it sounds to everybody else, obviously. But there's been moments, there's always moments in which you, you make a choice to do something to better yourself, even though you know it's the wrong thing. You guys all, everybody has those moments. And don't worry, I'm going to get to worse ones later in the episode. We all have those moments where we choose an easy road. And what I, what astounds me isn't so much that I did it. It isn't so much that people do it. I get that. I understand that human nature being what it is. What I find fascinating is that at that very young age, I felt that I needed to cheat. Now, Forget my mistake, forget my cheating for a second, put my, you know, dodgy morality on the side for a minute. What are we doing to kids? <laughs> what are we doing to little kids? Because this hasn't changed. Where we 
push and fixate so much on a mark, on a grade, on a whatever, that we make them, and I, that's a weird choice of words, I guess, but we kind of put them in the position and we teach them that they need to cheat because we've done that. We've done that. There, there's no other way around that, right? Because kids don't care about being wrong or being right until they're rewarded or punished as a result. Kids don't care about getting a hundred until there's a huge parade after they get a hundred. Now, I know some of you are going to be like, well, Joanna, we have to have standards. Yes, we do. I get it. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not saying we don't. I'm simply saying at what point are we putting this on kids to make sure that the standard is the parade, that the 80, that the 90, that the 100 denotes a parade, not the kid. And by the way, I wasn't this kid either. So don't think I'm making a, a you know, an evidence based remark on this. What about the kid? that works incredibly hard in those younger years, tries to understand it by all different angles, gets the 70, where's their parade? You know, because I think a lot of things come easy to some and difficult to others in different capacities down different avenues. And when we don't recognize the effort, and guys, Understand, I don't just mean, oh, I tried for an hour. No, 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 no. You guys know the difference between these kids. Hell, you guys know the difference between these adults. Who grinds? Who puts in all the effort? Who goes the extra mile? Who does it again and again and again until they get it right? I want that guy on my team, that guy at my job, that guy working for my company, right? We want, we want smart. I get it. I get it. We want our kids to be smart and accomplished, but don't we want our kids more than any of those things to know what it is to face adversity, not being able to tell the time on a watch. By the way, I have lots of watches now. I can tell the time. None of them have battery in it. I just look at my phone, but don't we want to teach kids the work? Don't we want to have the grind as the friggin' parade, the kid that's out trying to catch fly balls until the sun goes down, but misses it in the big game. Who gives a shit? Isn't, isn't that what we want? So I think about that mistake. I mean, and, and I'm still recognizing how silly it is because I was so young. But guys, if that was already embedded in my head, in grade two or three or whatever it was. Think about the garbage that is embedded in your 10 year old's head, your 16 year old's head, a 32 year old's head. You think it gets better? You, you think it gets more clear? I think for a lot of people, it gets worse. For a lot of people, it's only about the end result because with the end result becomes winning, becomes promotions, becomes money. And you know what we're all missing as we do that? Any degree of self-aware happiness. And I'm not saying chuck it all and live in a camper. You know, I'm not saying that. I am saying maybe that mistake I made wasn't a mistake. It was what I was taught to do. Not clearly, not objectively, but like implicitly, subtly. That was the subtext of everything I had done. And then that's the choice I made. Now, you have to take ownership for it. Trust me. I've written my fair share of clocks since then for my mom. You take ownership for it. You figure it out. You learn from it. Blah, 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 blah. But I want to talk about the idea of where kids start. Because I think it's incredibly important. And I think it's incredibly important for this big reason. We, we set up a dichotomy for everything with kids. You're a champion or you're a loser. 
you're a, you're a 90 student or you're a failure. This middle ground, which by the way, is where most people live. We don't make a lot of space for that. We don't make, we, we don't have a lot of fanfare for that. And yet that's where the majority of people live, right? The majority of people aren't failures. The majority of people aren't the 1%. The majority of us are living somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle of what? And I think our culture really does a disservice for that. And I think we, we, don't, we don't get the best we could get out of people as a result. That was an early mistake. That was an early mistake. So was that, grade three? All right, all right. Let's skip, let's skip to grade eight. Grade eight, I tried out for a baseball team, um, like a, a rep guys baseball team. And I was the only girl that tried out. And I busted my ass and busted my ass. And, and I was on the team. I was on the team. And the coach at one point looked at my mom and said, we would take her, but we can't. We can't take her because she's a girl and because we only have guy coaches and we only have other guys on the team and nobody can room with her and, and where is she going to get changed? And we're on the bus and we, there's all this traveling. And my mom in 19, you know, 90 or 89 or whatever it was said, okay, I understand. I understand. She explained it to me. Here's a big goddamn mistake. And I accepted it. At what point? And I, I, my mom and I have since talked about it. And she says, Joanna, why do you think I didn't fight for you to do that? I said, I don't know. I don't think anything bad about it. Then I don't look back on it. But, but when I, when I look back, what I, what I feel like, especially for our young girls is when do we accept no, because it's inconvenient at what age? I'm not going to go on a big feminist tirade here. I'm just wondering. At what age do kids excel at something and due to limitations, either social or economic, and, and we give, we say, okay, we say, okay. And then I just go about my day. When does that happen? Grade nine rolls around and in grade nine, I did horribly at school. For all those kids listening right now, listen. School doesn't always come easy and it comes in waves and it comes in levels of you get it or you have to really work for it or, oh my God, I'm never going to get it again and I have to drop out and like join a commute. It comes in waves. And anybody who says differently is not being honest, is, isn't being truthful about that process. Okay, there's geniuses over here, but geniuses over here have their own set of issues. So grade nine rolls around. And I didn't do horribly, guys, but I got straight B's. That I don't think I've, honest to God, I have such shame about straight B's. And I know some of you are like, oh, Joanna, that's not even about. Look, it was, everything had always come easy. And then I got straight B's in high school. And I, and I cried. And I talked to my mom and I said, I got straight B's. My mom never really cared about grades, which was interesting. All of the pressure that I ever put on myself for grades or for athletics, because my mom didn't play any sports, really came from me, maybe from my uncle, who was very, very smart and very accomplished when it came to, you know, his schoolwork and stuff like that. But I, but I got straight B's and I thought, that's it. I suck. This is it. I'm, I'm not good. Whatever I thought I was good at before, I'm not good at anymore. Whatever came easy has ceased to come easy because grade 10 is going to get harder. And then grade 11 and 12 and 13. And yes, I was in grade 13 because that's how old I am. Everything's going to get harder and I'm going to suck. And my mom looked at me and I'll never forget it. We were sitting in the McDonald's parking lot. That's right. I have a lot of memories of McDonald's guys. So when, you know, you talk about how much I go there, we're sitting in the McDonald's parking lot. She looks at me and she said, did you work for those bees? And I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, did you put in work? Were those hard fought bees? And I kind of put my head down. And at this point, I know I'm caught. Because at this point, every kid knows if they put in the work or if they didn't. And I hadn't. 
And I said, no. She goes, well, then you should feel upset and you should feel a little bit of guilt and a little bit of sadness and a little bit of defeat. She said, because you did that. She said, if, if you told me you busted your butt for that B and you worked and I saw you working and I saw you putting in the time, you know what? Never, you would never hear a word out of me. She goes, but I know you didn't. You went into a new school, you got new friends, you joined sports teams, you, you know, you, you do all these other things, but I didn't see you working. And she said, I think grade nine got a little hard. And as grade nine got a little hard, you decided rather than ratchet it up, you decided to try to coast because that's how it should feel. And she said, and again, I try to teach this way all the time. She said, you have to learn that not everything's going to come easy, but it's not that it's not going to come. If it doesn't come easy, it doesn't mean you can't get it. It doesn't mean you can't push through it. It doesn't mean you won't over overcome. It means two things. You need to work harder and you need to work smarter. And, you know, she said it to me with love and empathy and all of those things, but with a firmness, with a, with a strictness to it where she had never talked to me about marks before. She didn't even even care about the bees. She really didn't. She saw the bees and she's like, oh, okay. She didn't even care about, I cared. I cared. But I cared about the same damn thing I cared about in grade two. What was the mark? Where was my parade? Where was my sticker and my accolade for achieving a certain level of what? And I look back and I'm like, I'm pretty thankful that in grade nine, I got my ass handed to me a little bit. But don't worry, that's not the last time. <laughs> it's not the last time. Volleyball, grade 10. I fought with my volleyball coach um, all the time. I had a big, big mouth. She and I just didn't see eye to eye. Um, we fought constantly. I had a big attitude. I thought I was better than she gave me credit for, was I? No, I wasn't. So come playoffs, I was sitting on the bench. And as I was sitting on the bench and uh, the, the senior volleyball coaches, which is like the Mecca at my school, you, senior girls volleyball team was the best sports team at Anderson. Hand down, hands down, hands down for years and years and years. And all I wanted to do was play on that team because accolades, right? I wasn't even that good at volleyball. I don't even know if I liked volleyball. I like sports but I didn't work. I sure as hell didn't listen to my coach. I was too busy fighting with her. So I'm sitting on the bench and, and Gord Williamson walks by and he sees me sitting on the bench and he watches the girls play. And in that moment, I know he's deciding who he's going to choose to try out in grade 11. And I'm like, are you, you gotta be joking me. I'm not, I'm not going to get to be on this team because I'm sitting on the bench. And I remember feeling some kind of way about it. Like if she would have had me out there, right? So what did I do? Well, fine. I'm going to play rugby. I broke my collarbone playing rugby. That's not my mistake. That girl tackled way too high. But what happened with rugby is sometimes you get lessons you don't even know you needed. Um, because I sure as hell didn't know I needed it. And rugby has a way of visually, of physically... You either put it all on the field or you go home on a stretcher. <laughs> and I don't mean to be so ridiculous, but it's kind of the way it is. You got to put it. And if you put it all in the field, there's this amazing thing in rugby, especially when you're brand new at it. And we are all brand new. You muscle your way through. You give it your heart. And I started realizing what that felt like. And I also started realizing something even more important, which what it, what it really felt like to be on a team. Because on rugby, you're, the people next to you are a, like, they're not just your team. They're, and I don't want to minimize war, but it's like going to war. You're at the bottom of a rock. They have to be on you. They and so when you can do that with a group of people, 
You, you decide what a team is. You decide what hard work looks like. And by the way, I wasn't good. I wasn't good. I didn't understand the game. But what I understood in that single season was what it meant to work harder, stronger, better, whatever it was going to take. But I still, at the end of that year, I thought, well, I'm not playing senior girls volleyball. I'm not going to get the, I'm, I'm not going to get asked to try out. It's going to be a disaster, blah, blah, blah. And come next season, I get pulled aside and says, come try out for girls volleyball. I was blown away. I was like, what the hell is this? How, how did this even happen? He's never even seen me play. And the assistant rugby coach pulled me aside and uh, said, just so you know, um, you're going to try out for girls volleyball. I said, yeah, I got the thing, but I don't get it. And he goes, well, that's because I saw your heart playing rugby. And I know who Gord wants. And Gord doesn't want the best players that have ever walked this earth. Because sometimes that comes with, he doesn't want, he'll take, don't get me wrong, he'll take great players. But what he really wants is heart. And if he couldn't see you struggle, if I couldn't see you struggle and push through the struggle, I never would have known you had it. I don't know if you're going to make the team, he says. His name was Mr. Hussey. I don't know if you're going to make the team. He goes, but you playing on that rugby pitch, you definitely deserve a tryout. Your heart deserves the tryout. Guys, I can't tell you how that changed my life. How those mistakes I made changed my life. And again, I need, I don't know if I needed the mistake, but I needed somebody, I needed at some point for somebody to show me or something to show me my failures, the things that I was weak in, the things that I was, that, that I didn't have as a part of my character yet. You know, the things I was missing. Not to make a long story short, because I digress, but I made that volleyball team. I made it, and as I made it, I got this note. I was, I was doing a co-op placement, whatever. I didn't know I made it. But as I tried out, I mean, I tried out because I realized it's about my heart. So if it's about my heart, then I just, I just need to put it all on the court. I don't need to be the best necessarily, but I, everybody needs to know that I will die trying getting better, getting smarter, getting all of those things. So there I go. And I get a piece of paper that was sent to me that I still have, by the way. And all it said was, because I didn't know if I was going to make the team and I was at a co-op placement, it said, senior girls practice, 7 a.m. And that was it. And that team changed my life, not because I was great, <laughs> not because I, I stepped on the court and I was a superstar. It changed my life because I stepped on the court and I wasn't. I stepped on the court and I wasn't a superstar. And somebody knew that I had the heart to be something impressive. I was never going to jump super high, guys. I was never going to. I don't think that, you, you know, you, you're naturally born with certain skills. I'm a good athlete. I am not great. But and I've talked many years about this, everything else I developed, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the dives, that I would do anything for the team, all of that is the heart. Isn't, isn't that what we want to teach more than anything else? Isn't the heart what we want to teach? Isn't the grind, whether it's in school, whether it's in sport, isn't that the thing? And we're so busy, we're so busy with the final marks and the scorecards and the whatever it is, giving out accolades and patting people on the back who lost, but nobody is doing the hard job of saying, was it the hard B? Was it the hard B or did you slack off and watch TV and go out with your friends? Nobody's asking that question. That's the lesson. 
those are the mistakes we make when we don't listen to those things, right? And then I go off to university. Guys, don't think I've learned from my mistake because I do it all over again. First year university, I decide in grade 13, I saw Free Willy and I want to be a marine biologist. I kid you not, that's exactly what happened. And I changed my entire university programming and I decided I was going to go to Simon Fraser, which is in BC, 4,500 kilometers away from where I lived in Ontario. And I was going to go be a marine biologist and swim with the whales. Nobody told me that I could have been like, I, I could have had no degree and gone and swam with the whales at SeaWorld before we knew how bad SeaWorld was. All I wanted to do, swim with the whales. And I got into my first year university. And you know what happened? I wasn't going to play volleyball. And the volleyball coach, somehow I bumped into somebody on the team who said they were looking for a setter. And I went, hmm. And all of a sudden she goes, well, come try out. And I tried out and they thought I was pretty good. I made the team instantaneously. And then that's all I did for my first year. Chemistry class, biology class, calculus. I barely, psychology, I barely went. I barely went. And that year, I didn't even know where the bio lab was. That's like bad nightmares I have. I wrote the biology lab final without ever having gone to the biology lab itself because it was all written and you had documents and everything. I never went. <laughs> and then I got straight C's. And then I came home to mom. You know what I said? I'm not cut out for it. I dropped out. I'm not, I, I did the semester and I'm done. I came home. I said, I'm not going to university. I'm not good enough. And my mom looked at me panicked thinking, Oh my God, she's not going to university. Now what is she going to do? And I said, I'm going to, uh, my uncle's, I'm going to become a cop. It's good pay. He says, I'll get in right away. Who cares? I'm going to become a cop. My mom, pure panic because she just, you know, the idea of not having a, a post-secondary education freaked her out. Um, and I remember she looked at me when I dropped out. And she never once criticized. And she said, was it a hard C? And I said, what? Same lesson as grade nine, right? You think I would have learned something. Was it a hard C? And I had to be real honest and say, no. I guessed. I even had a tutor. I didn't do the work. I played volleyball. I skipped class. It was technically, it was a miracle, see? And, and she said, or, you know, are you, are you scared you're not gonna, you're not gonna get in? Are you scared that you're not, if you apply to university now with those grades, that it's, you, you're not gonna be successful, you're not gonna get in? And in my head, of course, that's what it was. Biggest mistake I ever made was this notion that I'm, I wasn't even going to bother applying because I was terrified. I wasn't going to get in. All my friends had gone off to university and I'm sitting here terrified. I have straight C's in chemistry and the book still had the cellophane on it because I multiple guessed through the entire multiple choice exam. And now what? Now I can't even apply to Western university and go there because my marks are so crappy. And my mom said, well, you have a choice. Are you going to, are you going to succumb to that? Or are we going to figure out what to do to get you back into university or at least at the very least try? She said, you're going to have to, you're going to have to make that decision. So I sat down and, you know, I don't remember the sequence, but decided, okay, I was going to apply to Western. I was going to figure out how to apply from what I understood. I could apply with my old marks from high school that this didn't even have to matter. And it was a one-off and people started talking. And then I did one of the first things again, that leads you to, you got to show your heart, which is back in the day when it wasn't all computerized, you could actually pick up the phone and call admissions. I know it's like a brave new world. Pick up the phone and call admissions. And there was a woman at Western admissions office office. Um, and her name was Kathy. 
Kathy picks up the phone. I explain my situation. I'm kind of panicked. I said, I'm going to send this in, but I didn't do well. And here's what happened. She goes, Joanna, Joanna, Joanna. Calm down. It's okay. This happens. Happens. I Something's going to happen. Like, your, your old marks are probably what they're going to use. I need you. We're going to, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. She goes, if you have any worries, just call me. Oh, I called Kathy again and again and again and again because I wanted to see, I wanted her to see my heart. I wanted her to see that the heart, that the easy C I barely even looked at, I wasn't going to make that same mistake this time. And I put it all on the table. And uh, I remember I didn't even wait. I didn't even get that package in the mail. Kathy called me. <laughs> It said, Joanna, I just got it. I sent it out. You're in. You're going to be this. You're going to be that, right? And then my whole perspective on education shifted at Western. I didn't take anything for the, for the end result. I didn't have a job in my mind. I had absolutely no idea. I didn't, I didn't have any sort of goal whatsoever other than I wanted to take things that interested me. I wanted to take things that... I found fascinating and intellectually driving, and I was just going to take that. And I took random politics. I took English. I took philosophy. I took world religion. I was all over the place. And then I discovered my sort of aptitude and passion for politics and arguing and history. And it all happened very, very naturally. And, and when you let go of what's supposed to be, which is, I think, one of our biggest mistakes, what we think ought to happen, what we think the end game should be when we let go of it for two seconds and finally just go with what we are, then great things happen. My academics rolled into exactly what my academics should have been. And I loved all of it. Absolutely all of it. Right down to the point where I chose York to do my master's thesis and I stepped foot on campus and within two months, the whole thing was on strike. Well, that should have been a mistake. I could have had a full ride at Western University. They wanted me to stay there. I would have had a great ride. I would have been in international relations. I would have been doing really cool foreign relation work and blah, blah, blah with these great professors that already love me. And I decided to go to this other school and they all go on strike. But when they go on strike, one of the most magical things happened. Not only did I meet people that changed my philosophy, that opened my eyes, that allowed me to see the world in a different capacity, and, and to be honest, opened up the possibility of me being gay, which is insane to me, that if I didn't go there and I didn't do what I did in order to get there, that I... I could have been a whole different person for a much longer period of time, not being aware, not being awakened to that. Um, but what else this, this strike did is it really politicized me. So it took me from somebody who thought I just needed to do well, put in the paper, put in the work. People liked me, people understood me. And now I got what it felt like to fight for something. I, I felt what it was to be in the middle of what I perceived as being an injustice as being very empowering. And even though we, it was the longest strike, I think in Ontario, when we won, what happened was there was this trigger effect of a bunch of universities not having to go on strike because we set a precedent. So I got through all that. Another mistake. <laughs> when you apply for jobs after high school, uh, sorry, after university for a teacher, you, you're supposed to get your OCT. And I was lazy. I, I can be lazy. And I didn't do all the things you were supposed to do to get my OCT. And I was annoyed by it. And, I, and then I couldn't apply for jobs that I wanted to apply for yet. And all of a sudden, I'm, one of my friends of a friend said, oh, this private school's hiring. And, and I thought, okay, well, I'll just go apply there. Um, it was a mistake. It was laziness. It was... And, and I ended up rolling into Metro for the last 20 years. Not only did I roll into Metro, but I rolled into a culture, a very, very alternative, crazy, amazing, fantastic culture. One in which when I sat down and did the interview, I fought with the owner of the school for 40 minutes. That is not a lie. That is exactly what happened. Talk about a mistake. 
what is wrong with me? I sat down. We had a normal 20 minute conversation. He said, what did you do your teachers, uh, your master's on? I said, politicization of teachers unions. And then he hates unions and I support unions. And we fought for 40 minutes. And I mean, fought. I mean, there was a bulging, you know, vein at the side of my neck fought for 40 minutes. I come off there. I call my mom. I already got an apartment. That's how I'm like, I'll get this job. No problem. I get all the jobs that I apply for. I call my mom. I'm not getting that job. She's like, why? What happened? I said, mom, I fought with him. She said, what? That's a mistake. That wasn't the right course of action. Now, here I am 20 years later. We still fight often. Yeah, we just had, we just threw down today a little bit. It's part of our nature. But I'm about at the exact school that I should always have been at. I wouldn't be doing social media. I wouldn't be doing any of the things that I'm about to be doing and I'm in the middle of doing right now because I couldn't have done it. I would have been, I don't just think physically restrained by the job and the union and the, the government, like the public school system, I would have been restrained by the fact that that job didn't give me freedom to grow the way that I've grown politically as a teacher, as a person over the last 20 years. I wouldn't have. And then about, well, when I was, uh, I turned 33, this is, this is the last mistake we'll do for today. Not to say it's my last mistake. It's just, it's a good one. 33, uh, I met who would be the person who would be my wife for the next 10 years after that. Well, 11 years. And when I say mistake, I don't mean it to devalue a relationship. I don't mean it to throw away a relationship. I don't, none of those things. I need you to understand what I'm talking about here. What I mean by it is when we don't know ourselves, when we're not self-aware, when we haven't done all of that hard work to get to know ourselves, understand what a boundary is, understand what self-love looks like, understand all of those different things, everything is going to be a mistake. I mean, there was a whole list of relationships. I didn't even talk about getting up to that one. Trust me. Problem after problem after problem after problem, of course. And we all just say, oh, they're just not right for us. Or they were crazy. Or this was that, whatever. No, 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 no. No, it's on you. It's on what you haven't worked through, what your relationship pathology is, what is broken in you. Even if you're the nicest, most lovely person on this planet, those are your mistakes. When people say things like what chemistry is, well, a lot of the times chemistry is a very real, very dominant, powerful thing that can be completely destructive. Being drawn to somebody and having that chemistry does not make them right. Does not make them right. And I had no idea about anything. And then I got married. And I got married and I had no boundaries. And I had no ability to say no, or to say, this isn't okay for me, or to say, what is this situation's not working for me. So what did I do? I said, yes, of course, I love you. And I kept running up a hill, running up a hill. And I'd still be running to this day had she not left. I wouldn't even have pulled myself out of that mistake. I would never have pulled myself out of the mistake because I didn't even know how. Because some of the biggest mistakes we make start with lies we tell ourselves because we don't know yet that are lies. So you go on this treadmill, right? I was on this treadmill and that's on me. A lot of people sit and talk about their partners and what they didn't do and how they weren't this or they weren't that. Listen. I'm not saying that's not, that's not the case. I'm not saying other people can't have damage or can't be selfish or can't be any of those things. Having said that, if you're self-aware, if you're, if you're mentally healthy, if you've worked through some, become at least aware of some of that relationship pathology, you can put stuff on the table and you can say, I have to go through this knowingly or 
I have no interest in going down that road anymore because it's not going to serve me. But if you're not aware of it, then you go blind, blindly down a road and some of us longer than others, you go blindly down a road and you make mistake after mistake, after mistake, after mistake. I severed friendships during that relationships because I thought that's what I needed to do to protect the relationship. Family, I excommunicated. I changed so much about who I was. I never would have been doing social media ever. It, it wouldn't have been tolerated in that, in that situation. I wouldn't have been able to be the person that I am because I was too busy trying to be the person I thought that's key. She needed me to be mistake. I can't even count all the mistakes I made. And it's funny after she left and I was obliterated. The only time I started feeling really better wasn't when I didn't want her back. It wasn't when I was so angry. It wasn't when I could point to all the things she did and my friends all knew the things that she did and could point with me. It was when I finally said, holy shit, I did this. <sighs> that was me. I set up that dynamic. I allowed that dynamic. I perpetuated that dynamic that was on me. And when I, when I came to that realization, even though I was far from healed, when I came to that realization, what I realized is the mistakes we make are truly mistakes because we are not aware. We do not get the bigger picture. We do not understand aspects of ourselves. We find ourselves digging holes we never wanted to dig and then having absolutely no idea how to get out of them. I think mistakes aren't a sign of just bad choices. Everybody make, no, 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 no. They're a direct reflection of where your head is in that moment. And it, it's not just a mistake that you had to have to get to something good. It's a mistake you had to have to understand something about yourself. It's not a coincidence. It's not a mistake. Well, if I didn't get dumped by so-and-so, I never would have met so-and-so. No, 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 no. If I didn't get divorced, I never would have met Anna. But if that was it, if that, all, if that was all the freaking learning I did, my relationship with Anna never would have been what the amazing, beautiful relationship that it actually is because I would have learned nothing and I would have made the same mistakes because my headspace would have still been telling me to make those choices because in my head, they weren't mistakes yet. They're only mistakes when you get smarter, when you get more self-aware, when you can point to them and understand where was I in that moment to make that choice? What didn't I do? What were my failures? What was my lack of understanding? And I'm not saying we all have to have it together all the time at all. Please don't think that. I am saying though, the people we're drawn to, the mistakes we make, the times we don't put in our full effort, the times we, we coast and hope things are all going to work out. All of those are reflections of how much we either understand or don't understand ourselves. It has nothing to do with anybody else. It had nothing to do with my grade three time teacher. It had nothing to do with my mom. It had nothing to do with my ex. It had nothing to do with my volleyball coach. It, these are all reflections. These people are all reflections of where you put your head, how you put your head, and the lessons you cho choose to learn, not about life, but about you. So those are a few of my mistakes. Now I have juicier, juicier mistakes, bigger mistakes, dodgier ones, ones that wind up with big public fights and dramatic lesbian drama. And I use the word twice on purpose. Times where I lost friends, times where I, I didn't treat people the way that they deserve to be treated. And I'll talk about all of that. You guys leave me messages, comments on this podcast, and let me know 
how deep you want me to go here. Because I'm also not in the interest. I, I have no interest in limiting how I share and how how big it gets, especially if what I say helps to resonate with something, with a fraction of something somebody else is going through. Because I think what we also don't do is we also don't talk about it, right? I can talk about 10 years ago because I'm done with it. I'm over it. Can you talk about today? Can you talk about the mistakes that you made yesterday in a real way? Can you admit that the attractions or the things that you have about yourself that are, that are leading you down roads you know you're not supposed to go down, can you admit that they're about who you are in this minute and, and it's not quite right? Because I think that's an important conversation. So let me know in the comments. Let me know if you want to share anything and I'll talk about that. Let me know if you want about any specific time in my life and I will go deeper and I will go longer about all of those different facets that I've just talked about. And until then, I will say the same thing I say every week around this time. I'll see you next Tuesday. Same bat time, same bat station. Have a great night, guys. Dismissed.